Hey, Dad. Hey, We're starting son. the second part of When God Comes Down. And in the last video, you ended getting the text from Dr. Siemens and the, from the, in the men's group saying, it's happening again. The Lord is on the move here at Asbury. And so what God had done throughout history, he was doing again and pouring yes. out his spirit. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah, actually, and and just to give a little little backdrop, you, you know, I had gone to a student awakening uh, kind of training, discipleship, where that Dr. David Thomas had brought in all these college leaders from all over the nation, and we begin to talk to them about the knowledge of God, about revival and getting a visioning a vision for awakening on their campus. And one of the parts of that um, week with those students was we went out to Cane Ridge, where the famous communion revival took place, and where for a week, 25,000 people gathered from all over the nation to hear preaching and the, where the Spirit was poured out and how it impacted all of what we would call the Western frontier, which was the Appalachian Mountains and how it had shifted whole counties out of alcoholism to where even to this day, there are dry counties in Kentucky. Now the Western frontier was filled with alcoholism, spouse abuse, beating wives was off the charts. It was a rough frontier with lots of risk, very harsh lifestyle. And yet the Lord broke in in a historic moment to Cane Ridge and shifted the cultural landscape to where over a hundred and some years later, when I was a student at Wilmore in Jessamine County, it was a dry county. Can you imagine in the nineties, you can't buy alcohol in a county in America because of a revival that took place over a hundred and some years before? Like that, 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 like, can you compute the power of what happened in that field. So we took these students to that came to look at the place where the Cane Ridge revival took place and the Lord met us out there. And there was this real sense of God's coming. So I get this text from Steve Siemens and from David Thomas, and it begins to grow. And just like when the Lord moved there in a matter of days, it goes from a few hundred, from 30 students who stayed after a chapel, just 30, 30 students lingered. They continued to pray, continued to worship. They, they wanted to stay after the chapel. And as they did, the Lord began to meet them there at the altar and they began to confess of their loneliness, their despair, their anxiety, their brokenness, their suicidal thoughts. And as they did, the love of God met them at that altar. And they turned to him, confessing of their sin and God meeting them with this healing love. It was a move of love at that altar and students begin to hear yeah. about it. People get, begin to pour in and within a few days, as it went 24 seven, student teams just began to lead worship and it was all unplugged. And it was, it was this little rough and ugly as far as music quality. And yet the spirit was there. And there was this corporate worship and prayer intermingled with scripture reading and testimonies. And within a matter of days, you know, 25,000 descended upon the town and the police had to shut it down. The town had to shut it down. Said, we can't, we don't have the infrastructure in a little 6,000 person town to handle 25,000 plus people descending upon that little building. You know, it went viral. It went all over, like unlike anything. For the first time, a move of the spirit was taking place in the height of the social media age. And now, everything. It just felt like hope, an infusion of hope just hit the body. 
Why? Because Asbury has this historic credibility. Moves of this of God have happened there. It's accepted by the evangelical world and the charismatic world, and uh, many denominations have seen Asbury as a credible witness of when God pours out his spirit. And so the Lord began to move. It began to overflow into other buildings. You took your youth group there, yeah. right? And it, I, I don't know, were you able to get into youth auditorium at the time? It was completely packed, and there there was overflow chapels, Estes Chapel, McKenna Chapel. Churches were filling up, so I asked a security guard to get us in for 10 minutes so that our youth group could just experience the hunger in the room, and then we went, and we were at an overflow room. Like Wilmore, it was overridden with people. I mean, they were saying over the course of, I think, 10 days, something like fifty to 60,000 people flooded into this small town. If you've never been to Wilmore, this is a small little town. They've got a subway They've got a dollar general, you know, like, it's like, this is a small little world town around, you know, around a college campus. And so it was, it's incredible. smaller than small. Yeah. It, it, you feel like you step back into time. It's so 4,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you, you even made this comment, Sam, you remember, you said some of the faculty members, even at the seminary who have been a little bit, um, what's the word, um, shy about using that language of revival or not interested in that type of expression went and you spoke of specifically one who went and then wrote about his experience there can you share that yeah i it it was less that these professors were like um resistant or opposed to something like the move of the spirit it's that when I took them as professors, they just were main plane. I'm going to teach you about Christian doctrine, church history. You know, you weren't getting that sense from them that they that they were that they're, they're kind of charismatic or Pentecostal, always seeking the next thing. Yeah, and, it's just not part of their vernacular revival. The, the uh, main plane discipleship. But hearing their testimonies of going, you know, I, I remember like my doctor Jason Vickers, an amazing you know um, professor of theology that I took there. I remember hearing his testimony of walking across the street on Friday, two days after it began going, I've heard about this thing happening over there, but I was really just writing my book on sacramental theology. So I'm like, I, on Friday, he's like, I decided to take a break and I walked over and he, his experience was that he felt the most tangible sense of peace yeah. and of God's peace. And he said that he was there for an hour and he left. And he says, I understand why students lingered because God's peace was so powerful. Um, which is interesting, like power and peace that like that, that rarely you don't associate that together. God, you know, but he said that, um, what he experienced, like changed his life that he, like, he'll, he'll never forget it. Like what he experienced in that hour was, something that would impact them for a lifetime. So that that alerted me. But when I read that on Facebook, I'm in LA on a trip. And I I was like, I'm not even there and God's doing something. So I, I fly in and the first thing I do on Saturday night, so it started on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, so four days afterwards, I go, I literally, I tell Maddie, I say, I love you. I know you want to see me. I want to see you. We pray about it. Can I drive down to Wilmore? And and go to this before I come home in Lexington, and she goes, "Oh, because you're so, flying in at what time at night? Like eleven o'clock." So I fly in at eleven o'clock. I mean, uh, Wilmore any time of the day is dead. Eleven o'clock. There's there's nothing happening ever. And I fly in. I drive down. And I'm close to midnight, and the room is packed, and students are leading worship, and instantly I felt that sense of God's presence, His peace. Students are praying for each other. And it's this realization of, Lord, this is special. You're doing something here. And wow. so um, I remember actually when I when I when I flew in and drove in that night and lingered for a few hours and and I instantly felt not only peace, but I felt this freedom to confess sin to the student that was praying for me, where <laughs> normally when Samuel was to confess sin, it's like. Uh, I maybe I'll speak very generically about my sin, or maybe I'll say I'm struggling. Will you pray for me, brother? But this this was this freedom to go. I'm going to get right with God, and it's clean, 
and it's pure. It's a lot of times when we experience the confession of sin in the church, it's like someone gets up and they say something and you're like, that's weird. You probably should have told that to someone else or not. From, but this was this environment of just the fear of the Lord is clean, converting the soul where you don't normally think of peace in the fear of the Lord, but they were there together. And that's, those are deep biblical truths. And what I wanted to share about Madison, um, was there anything you were going to share, Dad? I just oh, no, I, I just you experienced that one previous time in Dr. Wes Adams' class on revival. Yeah, yeah when I was was at, it similar to that? Yeah, I would say when I was at IAPU, there was a a revival course by Dr. Um, Wes Adams, and um, which Who, really impressed. tell about tell about him because. He gave his whole life contending for revival, but just tell, he he was a man in a wheelchair his entire yeah. life, 16 onwards. Yeah, quadriplegic and, and you know, was in a wheel, wheelchair and, you know, um, but he was a scholar. Um, he had, you know, been, you know, d- wrote many books on revival history, had even been a part of a, a translation committee for a really yeah. uh, impactful um I think is it the Fire Bible, Dad? Or I can't remember it. Yeah, yeah. it was Fire Bible. And, I think the and, Chinese renamed it that. One of the most popular yeah. Bibles in the world. Yeah, and so, but point is, a scholar, a deep man of prayer, and a professor at IUPU, and he taught on revival history, and he was teaching a lecture on revival is contagious. And the thing I loved about Doctor Adams is no hype, no, I'm going to manufacture something. That lecture was filled with beautiful truths and a deep reflection on how God has moved in history in the church. But it felt like the least contagious lecture for revival you could have (laughs) ever heard. And that's actually the testimony here. Yes. He showed us Dr. Ken Law's 1970, he did a video, the former president of Asbury Seminary did a did a um a documentary or a little special on the revival that happened in 1970 at Asbury and he played it and it was powerful seeing all these student testimonies you know this unceasing gathering of worship and then leading into sending students out and that you know, spreading across the country well we go to bathroom break after watching that there's no like okay come to the altar let's respond we go to bathroom break it's just, we're just going to move on we're learning and a student gets up and says, I feel compelled to, to confess my sin. Now, and we're like, oh. And what's crazy is my friend, Robert, confesses sin. And I go, oh, wow, that's powerful. And then another student gets up and another student gets up. I mean, this is, in, this is when I was in college and struggling with pornography. And I literally felt this freedom from the Lord to get up in front of all my classmates and to confess my sin. And it was this, what I, and it was powerful. And this, this class broke out from supposed to be two hours and it bled into the next class. And then the next class, I think they capped it there because that's when it kind of waned. So the spirit did something for five hours, but I remember sitting there going, the fear of the Lord is so clean. The worshipfulness of just God's presence coming and making us new and I remember telling people that week about it. And I've been on phone calls. I had friends saying, confessing sin to me and getting right with God and experiencing God's love pour in their heart. So I got to experience this little, that truth of how revival can be contagious, that you can even be watching a documentary and experiencing that, you know, 50 years later. But what's right. crazy about going into Hughes Auditorium this time, you know, February 12th, 2023, four days after it began, was it didn't stop at five hours. That's right. It, it was going around the clock. That's right. And not only that, I mean, we had another class join us at IFU. Two or more classes linger with us. So the room was filling up. But this was the spotlight where God began doing something in the whole in the whole community of Asbury University and Asbury Seminary and churches and college ministries. And suddenly the world's eye was on what God was doing. And what my friend Madison, who was an IFU student with me back at the time when I took that class, he was a part of the core prayer ministry team for this move of God that happened at Asbury this year. And he said something that was really powerful. And I, Dad, I know we're going to talk about these three characteristics of what happened, 
Um, and so I think I might mess up the order here, but one of the powerful things no, that go with this, go with that this. God this is was right. moving among Gen Zers, moving yes. among young people, and that the way that God was moving was to meet them in their need. And so he identified these five deep needs, these places where Gen Zers are struggling. And I'm a millennial. I'm like right above that. But I relate with a lot of this, you know, as a 27 year old, he said that God was meeting this. He said this, giving them a tangible sense of peace for a generation with unprecedented anxiety that God's saying, okay, you're struggling with anxiety. Here's my peace. Number two, a restorative sense of belonging for a generation amidst an epidemic of loneliness. Mm. Okay, loneliness. I'm going to give you belonging. An authentic hope, number three, an authentic hope for a generation marked by depression. And then he emphasized how a lot of people in our generation have been hurt by the abuse of religious power. And that God, one of the things he was modeling at Asbury was this protective humility. humility. And you'll yes. see that there was even big, some of the, I'm not going to name by name, but some of the biggest worship leaders in the world went to this Asbury revival. You'll see it on their Instagrams. They took photos, but they offer, they said, hey, we're, we're happy to lead worship. And I think one of the reasons why these worship leaders offered to lead that wasn't because they were hungry for the spotlight. I think it's because they were in the room and they were hearing what I was hearing, which was it would go from a 19 year old that was sounded amazing to a 19 year old that was pitchy. And you could tell it never led a worship in their life before. And there's like, okay, I'll offer my service. But one of the things that they did is they said, this is nameless, faceless, student-led. This is not about celebrity, not about ministries, and the sense of humility. And that that was really modeled well at Asbury. And then this fifth thing, which is interesting, as you said, Madison said, a focus on participatory adoration for an age of digital distraction. We're this generation that not only struggles with anxiety and loneliness and depression, you know, and we're skeptical of abuse of religious power, but we're a generation that is constantly like this. It's very hard for our generation to sit in God's presence in worship and linger, and just linger and adore him. And that's what happened. And that kind of leads to the first thing I'm yes. going to give the ball to you is worship was one of the, not only did God move among Gen Zers and meet them where they're at. There was a profound sense of God was restoring worship to his church and That's students right. were leading it in just loving Christ and beholding him and adoring him. And it was unplugged. There wasn't electric guitars. Right. There wasn't drum sets. There wasn't bass guitars. It was just piano, guitar, maybe a box drum, you know, but it was really vocal. The main instrument in the room was, was the, the voice singing. The voice. That's right. In fact, often this worship, this lingering this perpetual adoration that went day and night yeah. with these student teams that yes, with this pervasive humility, they had it. They had what's called a consecration room where the team that would be leading the next set would come in and sit and they would pray for them. And they would ask them, is your heart right? Is this about honoring him or is this about your opportunity? Which is it? Get your heart right. And they would pray over these teams and they would commit to be nameless and faceless to do it for his glory. And so you had these weak, sometimes uh, not very good teams who would lead the worship. And yet, because it was the human voice, which was the biggest instrument, sometimes even the congregation would dictate which song was going to be sung and how long it was going to be sung. A chorus would take off, and, and, the, and when the worship leader would go to bring it down, the congregation would just keep singing, and that would lead into another song. And there was this sense of, where's the worship leading coming from? Yeah. As Jesus was just being glorified. And in that context of worship, the love of the Father and the peace of God was moving upon people, and they were just being invited by the love of the Father to go up to the altar, where there was this place. I mean, there was few altar calls, and yet the altar was filled the whole time. In fact, the prayer ministry team just sat behind the altar in chairs and said, hey, the altar's open anytime. If y'all want to come up, come up. And people were coming up to give their lives to the Lord, to pray to, 
for deliverance from addictions, to ask for trauma, to be healed from trauma and despair and depression. And God was meeting them there. And there was this deep surrender. It's like students were just hungry. They wanted to do business with God. Mm -hmm. And they wanted somebody to to pray with them and to confess to. And and, uh, the Lord was doing amazing things, but all in this context of worship. Yeah. It was unbelievable, and it it was Gen Zers. I mean, this as it was touching this next generation, I remember I got there late. I got there two weeks into it. I went on the the two days, the last service on Wednesday night, and then the the 200-year anniversary of the Collegiate Day of Prayer where we had that main final service on on, uh, Thursday night. And... I want to say something. I I enjoyed the services. I participated in the Thursday night service. But it was Wednesday afternoon and Thursday afternoon that touched me. I was in Hughes. I got into Hughes Auditorium where the student teams were still worshiping. And I want to tell you, it was not the quality was not profound, but the humility that pervaded that room and the peace and presence of God was, uh, I remember weeping much during those two times I was in there just pacing and walking and committing my life to the Lord and saying to him, God, I don't care. It, it, I don't care who you use, just release a move of the spirit to this next generation. You and I both know the statistics about Gen Z. Yeah about their churchlessness, about their not wanting any type of organized institutional religion, their mistrust of institutions. And yet the Lord was visiting them and I was just crying out. And I remember you talk about humility, this pervasive humility of not wanting to mix a personal agenda with the move of of the spirit. I went to the uh, final kind of uh, brief for that 200-year anniversary for the Collegiate Day of Prayer, and we were going through the run sheet, and this was going to have, I'm talking international, internationally renowned speakers at it, like Rick Warren, Francis Chan, big names, and when I went there, every speaker Every worship leader was like, I don't need to speak. Let's let's just go. Let's get Gen Z up there. Let's let them lead the service. Let's let Gen Z preach the gospel. And a guy, I think his name was Zach, this, you know, 20-year-old guy shared the gospel that night. They got up and read uh, uh, the scripture and shared the testimonies. And... uh, I tell you, I was undone by how the Lord was using that generation. But it had this, as Dr. David Thomas, I I just heard him give a message on what were the characteristics of this move. And it was worship, this lingering, Mm -hmm. this, this peaceful, loving presence of the Lord that invaded that space, that then made it easy that drew students to the altar with kindness. Yeah. And then he met them there in the place of confession and surrender. And how after that, God was using this generation, as Madison said well, that experienced anxiety, giving them peace, that was riddled with loneliness, now gave them a longing. <laughs> I mean, this generation that has been just decimated Now the Lord is putting a stamp on them. And there was this desire to see the worth and splendor of Jesus magnified. And I tell you, I was undone by it. I was undone by it. It was, it was beautiful. Also seeing more than just the inner healings, more than just the getting right with God, more than just the surrender. It was also beautiful seeing the way 
people would give their life to Christ, but it wasn't this pressuring. It wasn't this, you know, sometimes you almost have to manufacture people to get them to commit their life to Christ in church. And when people would raise their hand and they would say, I want to give my life to Jesus. It's almost like that Luke 15 reality where it says there's more joy in heaven when one sinner repents than when 99 are, are righteous. It's like that part of the heavenly reality entered into Hughes and you would see the whole crowd just joyfully, oh. joyfully go, yes. Like, and it was this yes. uh, affirmation of, of coming to Christ. And there was a lot, it's interesting, Asbury hasn't flouted its numbers, you know, but I would say I saw dozens of salvations in the limited times that I was there. So it's yeah. only, it's only, we all, God only knows the true fruit of not only the totality of what happened to Asbury, but the cascading effects. And so what I want to do, Dad, is I want to talk about, since this video is going long, in the next video, I want to connect the this, this thread, this story about Asbury and those mentorships that you had in the 1970 revival, and then this move of God in 2023. I want to connect it with what now? What does this mean for the church right now? And right, was, because because what we saw at Asbury, it was as if instant hope infused the body of Christ, unlike anything I've seen. Two years of COVID, financial shaking, impending possible wars, and yet God touches this little bitty town. And suddenly where pastors had been discouraged, suddenly hope was infused. Yeah. Well, this is a big deal, and we must talk about what meanest thou this.